so let's get straight to the point. Today we are going to discuss, among other things, the mystery of 13 and the Vatican. Let's see what this is. And to start with this topic, we will begin with a mathematics class. How's your math? Good? <laughs> well, this math class is very simple. We are just going to add, okay? You all know how to add up, I guess. Let's see, I can up to 10. <laughs> well, what we are going to use for this somewhat mathematics class is precisely one specific topic. So, the transition between the previous Pope, John Paul II, and the current one, Joseph Ratzinger, Benedict XVI. Okay, this is going to be our topic. And we're going to show here a series of images. And furthermore, while the images appear, we will say some specific facts. And you will not have to do anything more than add the figures that appear horizontally from left to right or from right to left, however you prefer. It will be the same results both ways. And we add them by individual figures. Okay? Figure by figure. You add up. And at the end, you're going to say the, the results, okay? If you do it wrong, you don't pass, okay? <laughs> well, let's start with the first one. John Paul II dies. On what date? The second day of the fourth month of 2005. Okay, let's add. 2 plus 4 children, 6. Plus 2, 8. Plus 0 plus 0, nothing, right? 8 plus 5? 13. So far we're doing well, right? You see that the data is taken both from Vatican Television as well as from the press and other official sites that everyone can obtain. Okay, let's move on to the next thing. John Paul II dies at what time? 21.37 p.m. Let's add again. 2 plus 1, 3. And 3, 6. Plus 7, 13. Okay. Let's move on to the next one. Pope number in history, said officially by them, 265. 2 plus 6, 8. Plus 5, 24? No. 13, right? Well, let's move on to the next one. Time of the white smoke. You know, when the Pope is elected, they burn and white smoke comes out. 1750. 1 plus 7, 8. Plus 5, 13. One more. Time in which it is announced on the balcony, Abemus Papam, a famous phrase. 1840. 1 plus 8, 9 plus 4. The 13 comes out again. And now, Bishop of Rome buried next to the remains of St. Peter, they say. Number 148. Total, 1 and 4, 5 plus 8, 13. Up to this point, you've seen it well. Everything comes out 13, right? Let's see one more. Meeting between Bush Sharon, which took place on April 11th, 2005. 1 plus 1, 2, plus 4, 6, plus 2, 8, plus 5, 13. Let's see it in summary, in case or we don't remember the first thing, okay? We're going to skip this for a moment. A match summary, because they, they are matches, I guess. Let's look at them. Death of John Paul II, you see. Let's see the following. Time of death of John Paul II. Order number of the new Pope. White smoke hour. Time of Abemus Papam. Burial order next to Peter. And Bush Sharon meeting. I don't know if you've noticed. In the first six points, they are all precisely related to the Vatican, right? The other, we don't know yet, or it seems not. It seems to be a, a meeting between the United States and Israel with their main diplomats, right? Six thirteens appear at the beginning, and another one here, which coincides with the same dates, more or less, right? Is this a coincidence? It is a coincidence? Why, in all the newspapers, continuously on Vatican television that's broadcast for all the networks, these figures were given so often, bam, 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 they were repeated. 
If you bought the newspapers of the time at that time, anyone could see this. But how many of you noticed these coincidences, which gave 13? Well, let's see if these are coincidences. Are they coincidences or perhaps a message was being given with this? As if it were an encrypted code, do you understand? A comment is heard in the distance saying that they killed him. They killed him? I'm not going to enter here. I'm not going to enter here. In fact, if we remember the first conference, you remember the meaning of 13? For the people we have been talking about in these two previous talks, if you remember, we are talking about the world of Freemasonry, which used the Kabbalah, giving meaning to numbers, mystically speaking. So, perhaps it is appropriate to remember what 13 means. Let's see it. Death and birth, total change, transformations, 12 plus 1 equal to what? Messiah. This is according to the Kabbalistic interpretation. Therefore, we can get a relationship between those th 13 with what it means. Can we get a relationship between them? We will see it little by little today. But also in Satanism or occultism, 13 means a little beyond this. Shall we see it? It is equal to Lucifer or Satan. If we take what it means on one side, which was Messiah, and what it means in occultism, which is Lucifer, could it be that someone is announcing a Messiah who will be Lucifer? Is it an induction where I am taking you? Or is it a somewhat logical approach, knowing how the esoteric world works on this side? But what is the change they announce? Notice that the 13 symbolized a change. What change are they referring to? Well, to the transformation of that new world order, which you saw precisely on the $1 bills. And... They are preparing the ground for what? For a false messiah to appear, not a true messiah, but a false one, who will be no other character than Lucifer himself, who is Satan. Perhaps some of you may ask, but does this character exist? Well, we will see things, each thing in its time. But... What happened in Fatima, in Portugal, on the 13th of each month at 1 p.m., 13 hours, in the year 1917? We can see it. Taken from the Catholic apostolate, it is not my invention, right? The Virgin of Fatima, here it explains a little about the story of the appearance of the Virgin of Fatima, which says that first an angel, an angel of peace, appeared to the children, preparing them because then the Virgin would come, so that they would be prepared for that great moment. Uh, it's funny because even when you start reading, the Virgin tells the girls that they are doing very well, because there were three of them, but she tells the boy, either you pray a lot or you will end up very well. I suppose that the poor child would spend each day praying as much as he can, because after something like that, it must be quite strong, right? We may doubt whether this happened or did not happen. But do you know, if we start to investigate a little, you will realize that numerous witnesses report that they saw it and it appeared in newspapers of the time in Portugal. And furthermore, with something very curious, the sun did something and everyone saw it. The sun was not still. This is not normal. Many witnesses saw it. Were they all crazy? Were they all under strange pressure? What really happened there? But have you noticed? Thirteens. Thirteens again. 
in all the dates in an alleged appearance of a virgin. I don't know if you knew, but these last two popes, John Paul II and Benedict XVI, have both said publicly that they were very devoted to the Virgin precisely, of the Virgin. Could it be that it is the Virgin who appeared? If we are relating everything with thirteens, why again these strange thirteens so continuously? If we see that the thirteen is truly Lucifer for them, who really appeared, the Virgin or Lucifer? Well, I'm going to transmit to you a, pro a prophetic text written many years ago, found in the Bible, 2nd of Corinthians, precisely, chapter 11 and verse 14. It says, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. The biblical writers warned about this. Satan has enough power to take on the appearance of someone precisely heavenly. But now let's see something that was said by a cardinal named José Policarpo to Benedict XVI. Finishing the conclave, he told him, holding his hands and talking about Fatima, this is taken from the newspapers, okay, as you can see, commemorating the 88 years of the apparitions of Fatima from the sanctuary, a strange thing, commemorates the 88th anniversary, normally it can be 25, 50, 75, 10 by 10, 5 year periods, but 88? You knew, as we mentioned, that 11 had a certain importance, right? 88 also comes out as a multiple of 11? Then we will go into a little detail. Let's see what it tells us. He said, he promised something to His Holiness. It says, he promised that on the 13th he would come to lay his pontificate at the feet of Our Lady. If knowing this, we translate the 13 by the word we said before, at whose feet did they come to offer their pontificate? Of Satan. May it be. We are talking about an extremely important Christian religious institution. Can that be? If we continue reading, and I suppose you already know, John Paul II had an attack, right? You will remember it. And what day did it happen? A May the 13th. Strange thing, hey? And he said, and I suppose this is already known to everyone, that the hand of the Virgin saved him there. Yes, he did say it. Here you have the photograph even, the moment of the shot. It's impressive, right, when we see images like this. But there is another phrase which I would also like to highlight. Attention, the Cardinal assured that all the pastoral work of Fatima complies with the Pope's instructions, which are to deepen the authenticity of Christian life, and pay attention to this, of ecumenical or interreligious dialogue, or of building harmony and peace by welcoming those who come with a right heart. I don't know if you realize this important phrase. Ecumenical dialogue is its highest objective. What is ecumenical dialogue? Seeking religious unity. You know that Christianity is divided. Catholics, Protestants, then there are Jews over there, the Muslim world over there. Absolute priority is this. But I don't know if you've noticed it on the other side, when welcoming those who come with a right heart, they are welcomed because they want unity. But what about those who say they do not want to join this movement that they are promoting so intensely? Will they be welcomed? Or are they going to be discarded? Because according to them they are not going to have a straight heart. This should make us think, huh? Here you see it also. Benedict XVI promises ecumenism were the first words he basically said when he came to the pontificate. 
he would work for the unity of all followers of Christ, especially followers of Christ, right? It does not talk about the Muslim world and all the world of the others, no, no. It basically focuses on these. More phrases that we can get here. What is the Pope saying here? The promotion of the new international order. What phrase did we see on the dollar bill? Do you remember it? New what? New world order. Secular. Isn't that the same thing? New international order? And a Pope is saying it. And it coincides with what Freemasonry says? It says, a dialogue with Islam and with China. A dialogue, right? One thing is dialogue and another thing is unity. The emerging Asian giant that ignores the Holy See. So, with this, he's telling us that there is a certain tension, right? Between the world of Islam and China and the Holy See. What else do we see? Oh, wow. And the agreement between Israel and the Vatican? If you all remember history, it seems that there is a lot of discrepancy between the Jewish world and the Catholic world, right? The actions of the Catholic Church during the Second World War are highly criticized. Much has been said about that. Or much written about it. It was even said that they were instigators. I'm not going to get involved in that, far from it. But what is certain is that things, if they were like this before, have changed a lot. Because now, it is an agreement between Israel and the Vatican, Jews and the Vatican. Let's see more things. Well, here it explains even more things about this. I'm going to skip it, because if not, it's going to get too long. We'll move on. Titled, Brothers of the Hebrew People. And we see how they begin to say important phrases about how they are approaching their brothers of the Hebrew people. They are not saying brothers of the Muslim people or the Buddhist people. No, no. From the Jews. What else? You see, it's brothers of the Hebrew people appears here again. And here, they rely on some biblical text to say that there is only one flock and only one shepherd. Therefore, everyone has to be in the same fold, in the same flock of sheep, so to speak. Okay? Everyone has to enter, like little lambs there. What else? Beware, the Pope begins to warn against anti-Semitism. He went to a synagogue in Poland, which was highly anticipated because of what it represented. And then he also met with Protestants to cultivate ecumenism, the union of churches. Well, here it continues saying more or less the same. It is the second time that a Pope has gone to a synagogue after John Paul II visited the one in Rome. What else? Well, they realize that the symbolic burden of this visit reaches the Jews of the world. It is very important. Here you see a photo, really impressive to those of us who follow the events that are happening in this world. It is very significant to see this photo. It personally shook me, I'm telling you the truth, okay? When I bought the newspaper, especially because of this photo, because of how much this implied, because of things that one has been waiting for, for years, and now begin to see their fulfillment. But we will talk about this a little later. Here it says that Jews and Muslims joined Christians. It was the headline of a newspaper, but they only joined together to ask for the healing, a little, of Pope John Paul II. But not for anything else. If we started to dig, the shots of full unity between them were not exactly going here. Remember how John Paul II one day went to the Wailing Wall and was wearing a traditional kippah. You know, the little hat that looks like a broken coconut placed on top of the head. And he deposited a writing asking for forgiveness to the Jews on behalf of the Catholics and deposited it in a gap in the Wailing Wall. This was an extremely significant act. Let's see something else. World Council of Churches. Does anyone know what this is? It is an association promoted by Protestants to merge 
Catholics and Protestants into one fold, into one flock. But here you have the entire list of the numbers of Protestant churches that are attached to this great movement. At first, if we analyze it coldly, or superficially rather, it seems like a positive thing, right? Enough of the divisions between one another, since we all more or less believe the same thing, so they all go together. Later, by yourselves, you get to reasonings that perhaps cast doubts on this concept. And the World Council of Churches, although it only seems to be a Protestant movement, and the Catholic world of the Vatican seems not to be there, when you start to delve into the issue, you realize that they are also there. We already see a meeting between the Secretary General of the World Council of Churches and Benedict XVI. We see a lot of churches that come together to discuss these issues. What else? Well, more or less, who are the ones who are going to speak, etc. And here we see a meeting that took place between Jesse Jackson, the Reverend Jesse Jackson. Does this person sound familiar to you? Doesn't it remind you of the politic campaigns in the United States? He's a reverend, a Protestant. But I don't know if you knew, he's a Freemason. You know this? And it is known, okay? He is a Freemason, and that's what... You can rest easy with that, there's no problem saying it. And he met with Hugo Chavez. You know who he is, right? Who is ruling in Venezuela. And you know that Hugo Chavez is carrying out a somewhat anti-United States policy, to say the least, right? And among the phrases that they say, they say that they do not understand the world order that is presented today. Oops, doesn't it sound like there's been a change here? This change is precisely the world order. A change is occurring in all of this. What else? Look at this phrase. You know, sometimes people are known whether they are Freemasons or not by the phrases they use. Look at this phrase. He also praised the missions of the Chavez government, which he described as humane, humanistic and necessary plans. Now, humanism, you know what humanism is, more or less? It arose precisely from the Masonic powers. They were the ones who uh, tried to put humanism to remove Christianity, saying that man by himself can reach goodness and religion is not necessary for that. Well, this is a Masonic concept. What a coincidence. That's this man is saying this, right? And pay attention to these phrases, special attention to this word, the Sunday. Now you could say, and what does a day of the week have to do with what we are dealing with? Let's see something now. Because this headline says, it says, Spain, the land of Mary. This is said by the previous Pope. And continuing, we see how precisely the Sunday Eucharist is encouraged again. That people have to go to Mass on Sundays. Let's see more things. Benedict XVI also highlighted the need to rediscover the joy of Christian Sunday. Now, there are people here from this country, people who aren't. I remember when I was little that on Sundays you obviously couldn't go anywhere because everything was closed, except for some small things. But in the times of my parents and theirs, much more, much more. Sunday was a day when you absolutely had to be with your family because you couldn't do anything else. Society was set up in this way. Now things have continued to dilute, but now curiously we see these messages from Benedict XVI pressing again to the same thing as before. Let's see something more. He says that he based his Barry homily on his well-known disagreements with Western secularism. Not even for us, he said, it is easy to live as Christians. For Catholics, here. And, well, this phrase is quite strong. Without Sunday, we cannot live, said John Paul II. Um, do you live peacefully on Sundays? You do, don't you? We do normal life, more or less, right? He says, no, why? Well, we'll see a little about this. 
Let's see a text that may make you think. Revelation 13, verse 3 and 4, and then verse 8. 2,000 years ago, the following was written. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. It's talking, do you remember that we were talking about a famous beast? We haven't seen exactly what it is yet. Go figure out the details yourselves. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. So everyone, ah, behind this character of this institution, of this, what is it? And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. I'll tell you one thing now, so as to not take more time. The dragon in biblical symbolism, as it appears in other texts, is referring to Satan, okay? In other words, they worshipped Satan, who had given authority to the beast. Satan gives authority to a certain power, or a certain someone. I don't know. Well, yes, I do know, but I'm not telling you so that you can think for yourselves. Satan gives them a power. And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? This denotes that this beast must have enormous power, because who will fight against it? And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. The latter must sound Chinese to many, I, I suppose so, Notice that it is talking about a book of life. Obviously, when one talks about a book of life, you already think, wow, well, here is something that involves you living or dying, right? But it says that this lamb was slain from the beginning of the world. Here we would have to enter into what are called messianic prophecies. We're going to discuss this in the last of the conferences. What is the lamb? Symbol of what? You'll see in due course. It matters more to me now, momentarily, that you start getting ideas about everything that is referring to that beast, okay? We are going to see a very curious thing. Have you noticed this phrase that says, and all the world wondered after the beast? Let's see this next scene. What is this? You're, you all remember it, right? How many times was the death of John Paul II broadcasted on television? His corpse exposed, and you see the photo. Political and religious leaders from all over the world but who is on the front bench, kneeling, prostrated in front of this corpse? Bush father, his son is also there, and between them his wife, and beside him, wow, Clinton too. Are these gentlemen currently leaders of the United States politics? Yes, right. Who is ruling? Who is it? The president, George Bush Jr., the son. What are the other two doing there? Because I didn't see other nations taking their former presidents in heaps, like the United States in this case. For the same reason, others could have done it also. Perhaps things begin to change when we know, and we said the other time, that these three gentlemen belong to Masonic lodges. What a coincidence, huh? And the United States, which if we do a little history, you know that it was made precisely of people who fled from the Catholicism of Europe, who were Protestants, who could not see anything about Catholicism because, well, for them, it meant massacres, suffering a lot, and curiously, as the years go by, that same nation that represented the opposite, freedom, is suddenly on its knees in front of the corpse of a man who represents the maximum power of the Vatican. Something has changed here, hasn't it? You know, if you had told this scene to the first gentleman who disembarked from the Mayflower, the ship that arrived from Europe, shouting, Freedom! Freedom! <laughs> they had put their hands to their heads. They wouldn't have even believed it. Something has changed in these years in the United States. But, you know, this is the first world power. What this represents, and the first world power on its knees, before whom? A participant says, but... The presidents from all the countries, or from many countries, were assisting. And they translate, yes, yes, of all. Except, I think, I don't know if I have it here, or I removed it, so as to not use up more time. There were only two countries that did not go. Two. Russia and China. 
Oh, what a coincidence. Why not Russia and China? We're going to discuss this in the last of the conferences or the penultimate one. You will see the reason for all this. Let's move forward a little. And now what happens? The new Pope is elected and here come the congratulations. Who congratulates him? Well, we see the kings of Spain, we see representatives of churches from all over, Protestants, Orthodox, Anglicans, and the thing about ecumenism is starting to come up again. You see even Jeff Bush, the president's brother. The governor of Florida was also there with more than 21 Catholic congressmen. And now we see this text that tells us, And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak, and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Well, what power must this beast have her? He can afford to kill. He doesn't kill all this power or whoever. He causes the killing. He uses someone to do it. And he causeth all. This text is starting to sound familiar to you, right? From the other day. Both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. You remember the topic we discussed last time, right? And that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. Oops. What's a clue, huh? And his number is 600, three score and six. Before we have been reading some phrases, referring to Sunday, right? And you'll say, what does Sunday have to do with all this? We will see later if the mark of the beast is only the very chip, which will be the identifying proof and will be used to buy, sell and so on, or if this day can have an implication in all of this. We'll see in due time, okay? Let's see one more thing. The Skia's Truth was the title of this article. And look at what it says. The funeral for John Paul II demonstrated that Catholicism is capable of summoning the main leaders of the world before the corpse of its leader. As I said before, except for China and Russia, but everyone, bam, over there. What else? As in ancient times, the symbolic power of the church is very high. You know, sometimes if you talk to people in the street and discuss a topic, maybe about the Catholic Church or any topic like that, they will tell you, it doesn't matter now, they don't even have priests anymore. Well, it seems that analysts do not agree with this. And well, you need to be a little open-minded to realize the real weight of the Vatican. What else do we see after this? Its intention is to go from a symbolic power to a determining power. Jeez, what is a determining power? A power that is the one that dictates, the one that says, gentlemen, this is like this and this is like that. It determines the issues. Well, it seems to be that they don't want the symbolic situation much anymore. They want something tangible. Isn't this power? Let's go on to the next image. By the way, I wanted to mention something that fits in with this. It says, His figure provokes fascination in established groups, but anguish in dissenting minorities. Why anguish in dissenting minorities? Why can it be? What do you think? Because this minority doesn't want to play marbles? No, it is referring to someone who does not agree with what they are proclaiming. You remember the letter from the Three World Wars? Do you remember the end of the letter about a minority that would get in the way and that they would have to sweep them up? Oops. Well, things are starting to add up to me, right? Take a look at this writing. You know, the lady I told you about the other time who also wrote prophetically, look at what she said. We are talking about the years approximately 1900s, late 1800s. Through the two great errors, the immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness, I'll stop here for a moment. You know, it's widely taught that when a person dies, 
they go to heaven, they go to hell, they go to the purgatory, they go to the limbo, they go I don't know where. Is this concept biblical? You know, if you delve into the Bible, you will realize that this is not the case. The immortality of the soul is a concept that Plato introduced into the Christian world, taken from the Egyptians previously. But that the Bible does not teach at any time, and then, instead, all Catholic and Protestant denominations have it in their creeds. And it's not true, okay? And it seems so. Now, I'm not going to show it to you here. If you want, we can talk about it separately. But look, this concept of the immortality of the soul, that when one dies, you can be floating around somewhere. I'll tell you something. If someone dies and is milling around somewhere, could it be that for someone wondering about to come and communicate with us, those of us who are still alive, who have not gone through death, of course, if they are wandering around, why couldn't they contact you? This is very strong, right? What I'm telling you, because this, if true, would be tremendous. But that in the Bible is called spiritism, a thing that does not come from God, but from Lucifer. The sanctity of Sunday. Oops, what do we relate this to? Haven't we seen some phrases that began to put pressure on Sunday, like, oh, it must be observed? It must be vindicated, as it was before? What else does it say? Through the two great errors, the immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness, Satan will bring the people under his deceptions, while the former lays the foundation of spiritualism, the immortality of the soul. The latter creates a bond of sympathy with Rome, Sunday. The Protestants of the United States will be foremost in stretching their hands across the gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism. They will reach over the abyss to clasp hands with the Roman power, and under the influence of this threefold union, this country will follow in the steps of Rome, the Vatican, in trampling on the rights of conscience. Oh dear. This is a prophetic text. But the thing is, we are seeing how world events are transcending in this line in a blatant way that a few years ago we would never have said. And now we are seeing it. It's also curious that on April the 13th, specifically, in 1986, John Paul II visited a Jewish synagogue for the first time. He could have chosen a 14th or a 12th. No, it had to be a 13th. And also it is curious for Benedict XVI to say or do something very important. The date chosen for the announcement is truly significant, that of the beatification of John Paul II, who was wanted to be made a saint, you know. Normally it takes a load of years for someone to become a saint, and instead with John Paul II they were in a hurry. He must be made a saint as soon as possible. And when does he announce this? Yesterday was May the 13th. Blimey, festivity of the Virgin of Fatima, to whom John Paul II attributed his salvation in the terrorist attack. He suffered in St. Peter's Square in 1981, also on a May the 13th. What a mania for 13s. What an obsession. Why? If we do not relate the key word to replace those 13s, we will not understand anything. Do you remember the key word? Which was it? Lucifer. And, well, why did Bush and Ariel Sharon meet on the 11th, which adding up the month and year equal 13? We already know what 13 means, but what about 11? We haven't done it openly yet, right? Let's see what 11 means. Let there be no fear because divine law favors it. This is according to Kabbalah, not according to me, according to what they believe, these people. And what was to be favoured by divine law in this encounter? Because there was something. Bush demands that Sharon respect the roadmap and stop the creation of settlements in the West Bank. Stop that. And then we would see that something else was also agreed upon, and that was the withdrawal of the settlers from those Jewish settlements. Let's see more details of this. Bush calls Israel to order. He says, Therefore, Israel should dismantle the authorized settlements and fulfill its roadmap obligations on its settlements in the West Bank, the president stressed. Here it seems that Bush is the one in charge. It seems. 
He says they would dismantle 21 settlements, etc., etc., in Gaza and the West Bank. Okay, very good. What else? Oh my. Here we have to think about something. And where would these people go to live? Sure, they were a bunch of Jewish settlers. Where do we send them? They would say to China? To Fiji? Where do we put them? Well, let's look at this a little. By exposing settlements in the West Bank, he gives the impression that he is trying to exchange the withdrawal from Gaza for Greater Israel. What is Greater Israel? Does anyone know what the Great Israel is? Well, a Zionist movement that wants Israel to return to what it was before. A giant territory and everything for them, where someone is not needed there. And you know who is needless, right? Who is living with them there? Palestinians, Muslims. Let's see more things. The Palestinian planning minister says, The atmosphere in the old city of Jerusalem is more than heated after it became known that the Greek Orthodox Patriarchate has sold to Israeli companies, to Jews, the enormous imperial and Petra hotels located at the Jaffa Gate, populated by Christian Palestinians. Oh my, because there are Palestinians who are Christians also. The Palestinians fear that the settlement of the Jews at Jaffa Gate will be followed by the acquisition of David Street, which leads directly to the Wailing Wall. And the Christian Palestinians would be deprived of their neighborhood. Uh, let's see, let's see. How can this be? A Christian like Bush is speaking and he is making pacts for people to leave a place and then, curiously, the Orthodox Greeks sell the Jews a street where Christian Palestinians live. So that's the Jews can throw them out. Because that has to be Jewish territory. And we are talking about the old city of Jerusalem, where the Wailing Wall is. Why shouldn't there be Christians there? Whether they are Palestinian or wherever. Let's see something else. Look at what it says here. The unwavering support of the United States for Israel, combined with the evangelical blessings of its occupation, because do you know who is behind the Bush administration, pressuring it to do a lot of things? The evangelical Protestant movement in the United States. And that is super evident. And these gentlemen, what do they do? Well, combined with the evangelical blessings of his occupation to prepare the return of the Messiah. Good gracious, they are kicking out Christians from the Holy Land. What we are hearing is impressive. I don't know if you realize the magnitude of this. Christians living in the old town of Jerusalem are being thrown out to prepare for the return of the Messiah. And this is also instigated by who? By the evangelical Protestants who are behind the United States government. Because, I don't know if you knew, but according to the prophetic interpretation, at least from what they say, all of Jerusalem must be Jewish for the Messiah to return or come. That's why Christians need to be thrown out. And this is sponsored by Christians themselves, to remove Christians so that only Jews remain. And then, when that happens, according to their prophecies, that Messiah will come. Therefore, be attentive to everything that happens in that area, because what is happening in that area is not by chance or nonsense. It is because this is its maximum objective, and I'm not the one saying it, it's here. In other words, we have to see very strong things in that area, because the ground of the Messiah is being prepared. But what Messiah is the one who is going to come? Do you know? In the Bible, a return of a Messiah is mentioned, who is theoretically Jesus, who left and must return. The Jews do not accept this. They do not believe that Jesus was God, and that he left and would then return. They wait for a Messiah, a great liberator. Well, someone is going to come playing that role, right? And is it going to be the real Jesus? Or is it going to be that Lord of the Thirteen, who is deceiving with all these movements, with Freemasonry behind them? 
influencing all the churches with wrong concepts about it. Because then the one that would come would not be Jesus, it would be Lucifer posing as Jesus to deceive everyone. Do you remember the Three World Wars letter? Didn't it say that there would be come a time when everyone would be able to clearly see the prolific and clear teaching for, of Lucifer? Well, that is going to be the moment. What we are saying is, is strong. It still sounds like science fiction yet. But I tell you one thing very clearly. Since I have been from a very young age studying these things until now, I have seen how all the events have come together in this concept. And what is happening now, honestly, it impresses me a lot because it is proving that this moment is getting very, very close. Let's see a little more. Meanwhile, in France, something happens. And I don't know if you realize what's happened. Look at the dates on this news. In the newspapers from October last year, this would be 2005, and we talked about Sarkozy. Here you see him in a photo. It turns out that an anti-terrorist law is presented in France. Did you all see it? No? The law was quite shocking. It said things as important as those we are going to see now. The bill that will be sent urgently, that, that is in a hurry, to Parliament for discussion starting on what day? The 22nd of November. 22? 11, which is November. 22. Also, don't you remember 11 and 11? How curious, eh? And urgently, it had to be for that day. The National Commission on Technology and Freedom Information has received serious objections. Why are there objections to these laws? Let's see more. Video surveillance. The law will allow video cameras to be installed around buildings with a large influx of public, banks, shopping centers, places of worship. That is, if you go to a church, wherever it may be, there will be a camera that will record you and they will say, hey, hey, this one, look where he's going. So you belong to that group, be it Catholic, be it from a Protestant denomination, be it Muslim, be it Buddhist. What a way to study people, huh? And sensitive facilities are the places. It also authorizes the automatic surveillance of vehicles using cameras, photographing the license plates and their occupants in areas considered at risk. Well, that's quite some loss of freedom, huh? Communications. Communication operators, all service providers in this field, for example, cyber cafes, must keep for one year and provide the police without the need for a court order the technical data of mobile phone or internet connections. That is, if now some police officers, for whatever reason, say, let's see, I want this, they have to give it without a court order. That is, the judicial law, which is what theoretically makes good and evil equitable for all, it goes out of the window. It is skipped. This is very strong, okay? Police may increase identity checks, including information contained in the optical stripe of passport ID documents. And there are countries that still say, I don't want ID. Well, you see how things go in France. But have you noticed? 22nd of November of 2005. 2 plus 2, 4. Plus 1, 5. Plus 1, 6. Plus 2, 8. Plus 5, 13. And just to mention, follow Sarkozy's phrases a little and you will realize where this man comes from. If it is not a Masonic Lodge, someone tell me where he is from. So, we have to understand the reason for this rush. What else? What is 22? The truth, victory, triumph, everything comes out well. Good luck, power, strength. Of course, they were so clear that by presenting it on the 22nd, who was going to say no? Because according to mysticism, it will be approved. And, of course, there was resistance to this law. Many people did not want to prove it. And what happened then? Let's see what's happened. A few days later, here we are, there begin to be some brutal disorders in France. And you all remember that. Cars begin to be burned everywhere. Even some schools are attacked, etc., etc. Remains everywhere. They no longer knew what to do. 
Of course, the Muslim world that lives in France was making trouble, they said. Yeah, right, that's what they were saying. So, of course, people get scared. They lack security. They need more police. Come on, more security. Would anyone doubt that after there were these wild riots that shocked the public opinion that law was not going to be approved? What a coincidence that these uproars happened precisely after saying, we are going to present this law. Would anyone say no now after this? Obvious, right? You see, here's a map where they began to happen. Well, many things, right? Distributed and which also reached other countries. Well, if these are coincidences, well, fine. And let's see something else. Oops, the war in Lebanon. How many days did it last? 33. Remember, that's the war in Lebanon wanted to be stopped. And in fact, it could have been stopped a few days before, but suddenly from Israel, they say, no, we are going to extend it a little more. And specifically, they stopped, gee, on day 33. Why the 33rd? Is it for something? What does 33 sound like? 11 plus 11 plus 11, maybe? Let's see a little. What does 33 mean? Of course, it is the same as 11 and 22, each time increasing more, but pay attention. It is the number of the martyr or the redeemer. It is the number of tests. It is the internal Christ number, they say. Love, harmony. It has the characteristics of the six super sharpened. Careful, the internal Christ? You know, there is one thing that is very obvious when one begins to study these things, and that is that Lucifer always tries to copy the same thing that Christ did. Always supplanting. Then, notice, the internal Christ, of course, since it cannot be an external Christ, it must be an internal Christ. And six... The human soul, the number of man, victory. You remember? When it says that the number of the beast is a number of man and says its number is what? 223? It is 666. 666. So it is a number, as we can see, that refers to man directly. But we'll have to talk about 666 a little later because we still lack a concept to understand it well. Let's see more things. What is going to appear here? Oh dear. It turns out that now, on September the 5th, well, exactly uh, 690 settlements are authorized to be put up for public auction for settlers to live near Jerusalem. Just to mention, uh, do you know where the Israeli troops that invaded Lebanon settled? Precisely where those poor settlers were, who were thrown out as best as they could, and there was a tremendous mess. You may remember it from television images, saying, I'm not leaving. They said, yes, you are. Come on, pulling them away. Well, precisely there, the entire bulk of the Israeli army troops were placed. These people were in the way there. Do you understand why Bush and Sharon met? Of course, something had to be planned, right? And curiously, now it turns out that they have left there. And what a surprise, they make settlements there once again. So, what has happened? So much trouble for this? You see that this is not normal, that things are always done with a purpose. As Winston Churchill said, do you remember that from the phrase of the first day? Well... Let's see one more thing. It turns out that with all this, a book appears called The Vatican Against God, written by the Millennials, by some gentlemen, prelates of the Vatican, that is, Catholics themselves, who are in the Vatican, who begin to say, to denounce, the intricacies of Freemasonry inside the Vatican. Well, well. Catholics who are within the Vatican itself and denounce what Freemasonry is doing within the Vatican. And what happens as a reaction to this? This was on television, all of this. Well, 
Really, if you read the book, the data it gives are impressive, right? Well, it turns out that the Vatican withdraws the book. It became a book difficult to find, and in Italy they were all taken away. I managed to find one here. And also, they managed to find out who one of these millennials was, the nickname they gave themselves, and they began to pressure him to get information of who are the others, and, well, they had to go through a process, not a very pleasant one, I guess. Well, the book is retired. Why so much fuss over a book? And if you remember, the other day I mentioned about some lists that were circulating around Italy, denouncing precisely the Masonic lodges that were within the Vatican, and that have never been denied, nor can they be, because the data was completely official. That's quite something, eh? And now it seems that they are angry because this happened. Well, and one more thing, you know what this book denounces? A Freemason told me this a few years ago, and then, curiously, I saw it written in this book years later. And he told me that black masses were held in the Vatican. Do you know what that is? Satanic masses. In the heart of the Vatican, a Freemason himself told me this. Then, curiously, Roman prelates from the Vatican are saying exactly the same thing. Do you know, there is a text and maybe it makes us remember and start associating ideas. Let's take a look at it. It is in Revelation chapter 18, verses 1 and 2. It says, And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird, meaning repulsive. The great Babylon, if we compare other texts, is the same as the beast, okay? Almost completely synonymous concepts. Well, it says that it becomes the habitation of demons, and the black masses, you already know what they are, right? This is pure Satanism. It surprises me that 2,000 years ago, someone was denouncing these things, that they were going to happen in the future, and now, curiously, that future is for me and you, and our entire generation to live. After 2,000 years, these words are being fulfilled. But if this has surprised you a little, everything about the 13, do you find all these 13s as coincidences, honestly? Yes, it may be. I sincerely believe that this amount of 13s, for them to be coincidences, you would have to, as we would say in Catalan, filamol prim. That is to split hairs. That is to look for it with great effort so that everything joins together. Well, no, no, it comes out for them automatically. Could it be that they want to send messages with that? It's becoming clearer to me. I don't know about you, but anyway. If until now things were shocking, now we are going to get into a topic that someone told me, what are obelisks? Well, now let's see what obelisks are. And what do obelisks have to do with what we are dealing with? Well, let's see. Here, you see a certain relationship, right? What is this? Do you know what is on the right? You have no idea? Ah, Washington, the White House. Okay. And ahead, we see a little thing. Right? Now, let's look at the left. What appears? What is this? This is Rome, St. Peter's Square. And what do we see in common between one photo and another? An obelisk. It's the same. Right or left? Rome or Washington? The two, both in front of them, standing tall, have an enormous obelisk. An obelisk that is a gigantic piece of impressive stone placed vertically with a square shape that narrows from the base to its tip and ends in a pyramidal shape. I emphasize pyramidal, pyramid. How curious. Why do they have this? It's just nice and that's it. It looks good. They are monuments, yes? 
They are monuments and that's it. Let's see a little bit of all this. We're going to read two texts that appear in the Bible thousands of years ago where these words also appear. You know, obelisks are not a modern invention at all. Let's take a look at 2nd of Kings chapter 10 verses 25 and 26 according to the Amplified Bible, a biblical version. Jehu said to the guards and to the officers, Go in and slay them, let none escape. It's describing a bit of a conflictive situation. And they smote them with the sword, and the guards or runners before the king and the officers threw their bodies out and went into the inner dwelling of the house of Baal. Later we will see who Baal was. They brought out the pillars or obelisks of the house of Baal and burned them. Another text, Jeremiah 43, 13. Now from the New Revised Standard Version. He shall break the obelisks of Heliopolis, which is in the land of Egypt, and the temples of the gods of Egypt he shall burn with fire. What is clear here is that when the word obelisk appears, God seems to not like it very much. Because he automatically, wham, this is going to end very bad. Scholars say about it, obelisk, in Hebrew, matseboth, or something similar. I don't know how to read Hebrew. Term that appears in the Hebrew of Jeremiah 43.13 in the New Revised Standard Version. And that was translated as images in a passage describing the destruction of cult objects in the Egyptian sun city, Beth Shemesh, also called Heliopolis. It is the same city which means city of what? City of the sun. From there the obelisks come. Some of them that are distributed in various places among which one of them ended up in a place that you have already seen in photograph. Later we will talk a little more about it. Let's look at the obelisks in general a little, okay? We start with an obelisk that look, it is black colored black because of the stone with which it is made. It is black. And curiously here we see something. Do you know who this man is? Who is down on his knees? This is the enlarged image of the same obelisk and this is Jehu, the Lord we have heard earlier. An Israelite king of those times who is precisely kneeling in front of an Assyrian king. This man did not end up well, okay? And notice the sign there is above. Do you see this little bird? with its wing outstretched and something else? It was the symbol they had to determine that it was the sun. The sun god. Okay? Keep these concepts in mind. Sun, sun. Do you remember son of Fatima? In relation to the 13? Obelisk? A sun? Sun god? Let's see more things. Well, I had one le thing left to say. We have read it before, generally the obelisks measured between 20 and 32 meters high, so they were not very small, okay? They were a giant piece of stone that was quite visible. And they were used in the worship of Baal. Baal was a Canaanite divinity. When the Jews, the Hebrew people, left Egypt, they went to their promised land, to what God gave them, which was the land of Palestine, called Canaan back then. And there lived the gentlemen who were the Canaanites, who were worshippers of Baal, okay? Now, you will begin to understand the concepts a little. Now, know also that Baal was precisely considered or identified as Helios, the sun god, which for the Egyptians, his name was what? The sun god of the Egyptians? Ra. That is, when you see someone encouraging, saying, Ra, 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 you're saying son, son, son. Well, never mind Ramon, because that's another story, okay? Let's see what the word Beelzebub means. What does Beelzebub have to do with it here now? Why does he put this here, you might think? Let's see it. It comes from the Greek Beelzebul, and Beelzebul, Lord of the Infernal Mansions, name of the head of the demonic world, Satan. Supreme Prince of Demons, cites biblical texts where this word appears. In the Canaanite literature of Ugarit, ZBL means Prince, and the form ZBL, capital B, comma L, Prince Baal. Thus, some texts appear with the components of Beelzebub inverted. 
Therefore, the name referred to the ancient Canaanite god Baal. So, if one day you pick up a Bible and read Beelzebub, prince of demons, you can translate it as Baal, the sun god as well. Prince of demons, who is he? Satan, Lucifer and the sun god. So, who is it? Well, what a surprise. It's the same thing. It is the same. Let's move forward a little bit. And here we have St. Peter's Square in Rome, right? So, let's do a little history. This one measures 25.3 meters. You see that it is well located, a very pretty little square. And do you know why this obelisk is here? Did someone carry it and just plant it there to see if it grows? Well, no. It turns out that a man named Gian Lorenzo Bernini, who was an architect, who built this entire colonnade in St. Peter's Square, and this man, according to experts, was very influenced by a philosopher. Hermetists, Hermetists is people who is into the occult, strange things, and a German Jesuit. I mean, look, right? It seems a contradiction being a Jesuit and being an occultist. Well, it was possible. And this man was named Athanasius Kircher. This man also said that he was a specialist in Egyptian hieroglyphs. And you'll see why Egyptian, of course. Curiously, around the obelisk, do you see anything? What is there around the obelisk? There is a circle, right? You all see it well? Okay. Well, the ancient Egyptian priests, like the world of Freemasonry, know and relate that when there is an obelisk with a round shape, a circle around, it is a symbolism of something very specific the city of the sun, Bet Shemesh, Heliopolis in Egypt. Why is it relating one thing to the other? This is put here by people who were precisely involved in the world of the occult. You know, this obelisk at first was taken by Nero to a Roman circus. As time went by, it was half fragmented and half buried, and then this man recovered it and put it right here. Why? In 1784, Ignace van Boehm, Grand Master of the Crowned Hope Lodge in Austria, published an extremely interesting article on the relationship of Freemasonry with the mysteries of Isis. Who is Isis? The Egyptian goddess, sister of Horus, god of the sun. By the way, the composer Mozart belonged to this Masonic Lodge. Did you know that? Mozart was also involved in these things, the great genius of music. But what about the Washington Obelisk? What is it? It is a monument that is known as the monument to George Washington, the first president of the United States. And well, of course, it's not that old. You see, here is its construction. And what do you see? Oh. They also put a circle on it. I didn't put the circle there. We only marked it so you could notice it, okay? Below, you can see that it is currently surrounded with uh, flags in a round circle. Why this? Why inside a circle? Do you know what the obelisk means? It's curious, huh? Well, before this, I'm going to tell you something. Have you noticed how it is placed? What is there at the bottom? The capital. And when the presidents come out to speak, they always come out looking where? Towards here. Curiously, in a straight line. And what is behind the people? The obelisk. I don't know if you've noticed who, but hey, Keep this in mind, okay? George Washington. We saw this photo the other day. Now, look at the details. What is there at the top at, on the right? The Capitol. And what's up there? Wow, a little eye. Illuminated, right? Let's see. 
What else? The dollar, the dollar pyramid. And what do we see by comparison? Is it not the same? The Masonic eye, the all seeing eye. Well, you see how things are starting to come out here. That's the all seeing eye. What did it symbolize? You remember? It symbolized Lucifer. Well, now let's see a little more. We were talking about St. Peter's Square. I'm afraid to uh, get too close so as to not ruin this. You see the obelisk in St. Peter's Square? Do you all see it? Okay. Can you see that there is also a straight line where people stand on both sides and leaving all this passage free? And what happens here? Who's officiating down here? The Pope. When he leaves, he comes out. He officiates right here. You realize that there is always... Let's see the other take. When the Pope comes out from his balcony, where is he going to look at? Look. Impressive. Honestly, when I recorded these images from television, when he came out being chosen, I couldn't do anything but really be impressed. And you will know more why in a moment. But when I saw this image of the Pope looking at the crowds, but in a straight line at what? To the obelisk? Like at the Capitol when the President comes out, he looks towards the obelisk. This was telling me many things as a direct line of influence. Let's look at this a little. For occultists, do you know where the spirit of the ancient Egyptian god Ra resides or still resides? Inside the obelisk. In the obelisk. In it. For an occultist, this is not a pile of stone. The things are symbolisms of something and transfer something to people. So, we go out there and say, oh, a piece of stone, okay, well, I like it or I don't like it, and that's it. Not for them. For them, it is a source of energy that transmits something to them. Symbols convey things. Nothing to do with any of us, with our ordinary people's thinking. So, if that is Ra, the sun god, equal to Baal, equal to Lucifer, who is he addressing to when he comes out like that? Just to the crowds? To be acclaimed to say something like the President of the United States? No. He is receiving the direct influence of the spirit that they say is Ra, of Lucifer. And these are their symbols. And we don't know this, at least if we start digging a little. So now, every time you watch television and see when they come out to talk, notice if they show any more snapshots, because those images are seen often. And it's not for nothing. But then, if um, that same presence represents Lucifer, Satan, that is why the obelisk is so important in the world of Freemasonry. Remember the tombs we saw on the first day in the United States? Tombs of some Freemason gentlemen? They all had crosses on their tombs, right? No. No. What did they have? They had obelisks. Now, why? Well, because for them, that is their god, Lucifer. What's a big difference, eh? So if you now go to any cemetery, and in Barcelona, more than here, you can walk among the graves. And if you watch Hollywood movies, look at those cemeteries where they bury them in the ground. And you see them that normally between the crosses, suddenly, bam, obelisks. Why? Why is this? Did they grow there like mushrooms? No, because underneath there is a Freemason. Underneath there is a Freemason buried, see? So, do you see where their doctrine comes from? But, what a coincidence that 
what does the day praised and sanctified by the papacy mean? Sunday. What does it mean? Dies solis, day of the sun. That's what Sunday means. Day dedicated to the God that all pagans worshipped, who was the sun. And curiously, that day is the same day that they are now promoting so much, so that the world observes it as a day of rest. What things, eh? What strange coincidences. Does this have anything to do with the mark of the beast? We will see this in the last of the conferences. And now we are going to do a little something that you may say, hey, this has nothing to do with what we are seeing. Let's take a look. We are going to the United States. New York presents the new, safer design of the Freedom Tower. Why? Do you know that there was a plan, right, where, which is ground zero, where the Twin Towers were? That is, plans were made to build the tower, right? And a project was made. When it was already approved after a lot of work, it turns out that they say, careful, we've realized that if a car comes carrying a firecracker inside, it can take down the entire building very easily. Therefore, everything must be changed. Changing everything meant that the entire project had to be changed from top to bottom, and the original shape was also changed. And curiously, when a project takes so long to complete, to go to auction, etc., in five months, bam, change of project. Well, I can't imagine what a task it is for architects to do everything in five months. You know, it is quite doubtful that a project of that enormous magnitude can be done in five months. Very doubtful. And why was the project changed? Just because if a truck passes by and knocks it down, everything goes kaput? Well, let's see why. Let's see, now the new project is shaped like an obelisk, oh my! Square on its ground floor, but which loses mass as it goes up and makes each facade actually triangular. More things. An antenna with a headlight that Childs rated, the one who did it, like a light sculpture. Above the obelisk, a lighthouse. A light. What does the name Lucifer mean? What does it mean? Does anyone know? Is he not the bearer of light? What a coincidence, huh? And they put it on top of the obelisk, which they say is shaped like an obelisk. And an obelisk is already an emblem of Lucifer. What else? Oh dear. The height of the obelisk is a patriotic height of 1,776 feet, an Anglo-Saxon measurement, which is equivalent to 540 meters, which is a symbolic reference to 1776, the date of the Declaration of Independence. Do you remember that we showed the dollar bill, and that's the base of the pyramid, the date 1776 appeared in Roman figures? And it was said, it is the Independence Day of the United States. Ta-da! Well, no, because it also coincided with the inauguration date of the Illuminati Order in Bavaria, which coincidentally coincides with the fact that the current Pope is precisely from Bavaria. Well, it must be a coincidence. But would it be because of the patriotic date, that is 1776, or would it be something else? It says this symbolic reference essential for the Republican governor, careful, essential, hey, can't do without it, and possible candidate for chair George Pataki is all that remains of Leibskind's original design, meaning that the only thing that's matched with the other project is the measurement. Curious. Selected by Pataki after the 2003 competition, Leibskind, who is still responsible for the general plan for the area, insisted yesterday that the height is not a rhetorical metaphor. So it means something, and they themselves are saying it. They are saying, no, it has a meaning. Attention, right? Let's see something else. This is the design of the Freedom Tower. Well, see, this is the design that will, as it will turn out. Really impressive, right? Yes, a lot. And what does it say it is? It will have a height of 540 meters and will be shaped like an obelisk. 
well, I don't know how you see this, but it turns out that what they call the Tower of Freedom, which there are also more phrases that say it is the liberation of the Jewish people, that as a symbol, okay, it's curious. Okay? So, curiously, it coincides that now in New York, a giant obelisk is being made, replacing the Twin Towers. Which, curiously, isn't it that they are offering, at a general level, a monument to Satan? It's impressive. Do you remember what day the Twin Towers fell? An 11th, right? Are we beginning to see the relationship between all these things now? Can it be that I am prompting you to see it this way? Or is it that thinking for yourselves, you realize that there are too many coincidences? Well, now let's look at another topic where you'll say, bah, this has no relation. The Pope's staff, the little stick that Popes carry, okay? Do you see this one? John Paul II, what is he carrying in his hand? A staff, right? Which is a cross with a nailed Christ. Let's see. Now, this is Joseph Ratzinger, the current Benedict XVI. What is he holding in his hand? A staff, too, right? It's the same one, right? You know, when he was elected, Joseph Ratzinger said something, and it appeared in the newspapers. It said, what crucifix is he going to wear? This question was raised, it was in the newspapers. In a clear gesture of continuity, he used the same crucifix as his predecessors, in plural. Did only John Paul II carry it, or did someone else? Well, it turns out that, well, here we can see a bit more. It says, next to the ring in Benedict XVI's hand, the same crucifix staff on which his predecessors leaned on, Paul VI, John Paul I, and John Paul II. Look what appears here. Paul VI, the first to carry this staff. It's the same one. See? Here we see it frontly. Is it nice? Aesthetically, I'm asking you. Is it pretty? What does it transmit to you? Awesome good vibes, huh? Yeah? Personally, in, in Catalan, I would say Masgarifa. Does anyone know how to translate the word Masgarifa? It makes me shudder. It gives me a bad feeling. And you understand? With an ree. Well, that's kind of chill, okay? There is a participant that is asking, why do they always remember Christ as crucified? Why is, is he always crucified? And Victor answers, and why not so much resurrected, right? Well, uh, this is another topic. <laughs> and if we start with theology now, this could go for a long while. So um, we will talk about it if you want at another time. The issue you have raised is very interesting. So, where is the origin of this crucifix? Did Paul VI invent it and say, let's see, I want you to make me a cast of a scrawny Christ nailed to a cross and that looks disgusting. There is someone asking a question, but it cannot be understood. Not exactly this, but yes, because they were a sign of ostentation of power. The staffs meant, I'm in charge here. They were like a scepter, okay? Well, was Paul VI the one who designed it? Or not? Let's do a little history. You know what this crucifix is known as? Try and give it a nickname. Let's see, what would come to mind when you see it? The ugly one. Tell me another little word with which you could define it. Or oh, three words. Okay, uh, it's gloomy. Ah, okay, yes. The crooked cross. Clear, obvious. You, do you see the arms of the cross? They're not straight. All the crucifixes that Catholics wear, notice, they are always rectilinear, right? A perfect horizontal angle in the arms. On the other hand, from here, it falls from the sides, right? And Christ's figure, oh, skinny legs, huh? And the thin arms? 
The truth is that if you see it a little badly, it even looks like a sardine more than a Christ, seriously. And someone says, to me it seems like the symbol of death. You think it's a symbol of death? Yes, he carries death in his hand. It sounds diffuse. Okay, let's see what all this really means. Let's see it, okay? Look at what Piers Compton, former editor of a Catholic newspaper, this is, he is a Catholic and a very staunch one, wrote about the universe. He is a traditional practicing Catholic. And do you know what he denounces? The infiltration of Freemasonry into the Catholic Church. Oh well. Let's see what he says. Because he not only talks about Freemasonry in general, he talks about the Illuminati infiltrated within the Vatican. And in a book of his in English, which translated is The Broken Cross, The Hidden Hand in the Vatican, if you want, I'll tell you, it is written in 1981, it talks about Paul VI, the last Pope we had seen, or the first one, who carried that crucifix. Pay attention to what it says, and this is not an invention, it is history. He also made use of a sinister symbol, used by... Who, who would you say that used this? Some children who were going to uh, take sheep somewhere? Pay attention to what I'm going to read, okay? Used by Satanists in the 6th century. It had been revived at the time of Vatican II. The time of Vatican II is when John XXIII, the good, famous Pope, started with something very important. From there, the Second Vatican Council was born with the ultimate purpose of carrying forward ecumenism, the unity of Christians between Catholics and Protestants, and that from then on everything would be done with that purpose, and of which each Pope who has gone in succession has gone further, pushing the accelerator a little for this project, until the current one, and well, his foot almost came off the accelerator. Yes, by pushing so hard on it. What else does he say? This was a crooked or broken cross on which was displayed or was to be seen a repulsive and distorted figure of Christ, of which practitioners of black magic and witches of the Middle Ages had used to represent the biblical term Mark of the Beast. There you go. Thus, not only Paul VI, but his successors, the two John Pauls, both of them, because you know that's one died after how many days? After how many days did the first Pope called John Paul die? That's 33. Oh, he died of a natural death. I'm not going to say anything, but 33. I don't know. Well, it says... If his successors, the two John Pauls, carried that object and raised it, they held it up so that it would be revered by the crowds who had not the slightest idea that it represented the Antichrist. So, to whom? To Satan. Therefore, every time the Pope goes and you see him on television with this crucifix in front of him, and everyone doing, oh, oh. Who are they standing before without knowing it? Before Satan, before Lucifer. What ways to convey things without people finding out poor things? Well, some last minute ones. that fits perfectly with what we are mentioning for today's topic. You can judge it for yourselves. Let's see. What precisely happened on September 14th of 2006? Some phrases from the Pope about Jihad raised protests from Islamic leaders around the world. Have you all seen it on television? No? What a mess is made. Because he has used some phrases that, well, 
Can we zoom on it? Oh, we don't have the images. Oh, this is a problem now, let's see. Well, let's see. It turns out that he is at the University of Regensburg, where he himself has served as a professor of theology, the current Benedict XVI, when he was Joseph Ratzinger, and there he uttered some phrases. Do you know how many days he was visiting? Six. Six. He could visit four, he could be nine. No, six. Well. And do we see the following? Let's see what he says. Remember, now in a few days he has to go to Turkey. You know the problem with Turkey? If if it enters the European community, if it doesn't, Turkey is a border link between the Islamic world and the Christian world. It's in the middle, right? It's in a crucial place. And do you know that they advocate a Western life and they also maintain their Islamic beliefs, right? So this raises a great problem for them, for the Islamic world and for the European Christian world, in quotes, okay? True, right? And these sentences have occurred before going there. They have created a stir in all Muslim countries, of course. And he says that he cited a 14th century dialogue between the Byzantine Emperor Manuel II, a paleologist, and a very cultured Persian in which they talk about jihad. Benedict XVI recalled that the Quran preaches it and at the same time disavows it. Since Muhammad calls not to force anyone to convert by force, the Pope concluded that, as the Emperor said, spreading the faith with violence is irrational because acting irrationally is contrary to the nature of God. And he implied that reason is present in the Christian God, while the Islamic God is so transcendent that his will is not linked to any of our categories, not even rationality. And he cleared this out. Now, what had to happen in the face of statements like this? And stronger ones, because there are more things that perhaps we will see later. Well, the representatives of the Muslim world are going to sit back and... Oh, you're right. It's true. Are they going to say that? It's absurd. What the, are they going to do? Normally, getting angry is logical, right? They are stepping on their faith. And, of course, they ask him to present apologies for the offence to the Prophet and Islam. Now, do you remember that the other two conferences led us to a very practical conclusion? Luciferian Freemasonry is working on two opposing sides. The Christian and Jewish world, remember, the union is not only between Catholics and Protestants, Jews also are there, and they are also working in the Islamic world from behind to create what? confrontation. That was very clear to us, and now precisely at such opportune moments, after almost a year of the famous comic images that came out in Denmark and caused so much commotion, these phrases now appear in the middle of a situation that you already see how it is worldwide, right? Now, let's take a look at a comment before continuing with this. I don't know if it's going to appear now or if it's altered. Okay. I bought this newspaper because it caught my attention. It's a newspaper that I don't normally buy. It's the ABC. And there was an article that couldn't be missed, okay? Esotericism and Politics, 11M. What's happened on the 11th of March? Do you remember it? The Madrid attacks, right? So those trains that exploded. And there was a massacre. Very sad. Let's see what this man writes. Seven million American citizens say that they believe that Elvis Presley is alive. Many others around the world firmly maintain that no Jew went to work in the Twin Towers on September the 11th of 2001. Warned of the satanic plan hatched by the new wise men of the Zion Protocols. 
which are the leaders of the Freemasonry today, it is said. The supposedly doctored photographs of the first trip to the moon are circulating again on the virtual network. You know that's curiously, when evidence of the footage was requested, it now turns out that seven boxes, seven boxes of the original footage where man stepped on the moon have been lost. <laughs> Funny, huh? Well, of course, how aren't there going to be people who say, and for many years now, that there are things that don't add up in those films. I'm not going to go into that now, but hey, this man is laughing at all this, right? Subjected once again to a reducible epidemic of denialism, the most universally successful book of recent years is a delirious novel about a secret plot installed since the depths of centuries within the Catholic Church, which leaves in underwear the occult societies that Umberto Eco hinted at in the sharp conspiratorial parable of Foucault's pendulum. He's referring to the Da Vinci Code, I guess. In a more ordinary environment, there are numerous compatriots in Spain convinced that Jesus Gil y Gil, who you already know who was president of Athletic of Madrid, the football club and mayor of Marbella in Malaga, he faked his death and lives comfortably as a refugee in Venezuela. Of course, you see, he's taking data, mixing it up a bit and saying all this nonsense. Let's see what else he tells us. Suspicion, like slander, has the advantage that it does not need to be proven. It is enough for it to make its way through a maliciously induced plausibility. What is this saying? This phrase is extremely important, right? That anyone who says what, for example, what we are talking about these days here is maliciously manipulating with truths in a, well, a lightly manner, eh? Inducing people to do things that are not correct. Okay, so if we continue reading, it says, On a humid autumn afternoon in Seville, the writer Antonio Munoz Morena reflected on Wednesday about the collective need to cling to paranoia as a substitute for ideologies crushed by the massive dominance of cultural superficiality. So, that is, since people are bad in the society where they live, they cling to paranoia, to conspiracies, right? Paranoia flows through the channels of irrationality and fosters suspicion as a discursive method based on its suggestive power of persuasion. A prosaic reality can never compete in attractiveness with the fascination exerted on the popular subconscious by a well-adorned conjecture with the seductive appearance of a conspiracy. The deceased on the trains deserve the light of the truth, but not the disrespectful shaking, the irresponsible manipulation of their tragedy in a cabalistic delirium of conspiracies and puppets led by fanatic demagogues and effective sorcerer's apprentices. <laughs> okay, so not just me, but anyone who is saying these things and presents things as surprising as what you have seen these days with tangible evidence and that they say is not tangible evidence that they are neither evidence or anything that they are more or less nonsense what are they? well they are fanatical demagogues and sorcerous apprentices okay? be careful because I'm going to do a spell here any day now you realize? you remember how I told you the first day that's the best way when something cannot be denied is to discredit it? Curious, huh? It seems to have been done on purpose so that we could expose it. Well, seriously. Let's continue. These images were precisely presenting us with the reactions of the Islamic world, which, if you've seen the news, is logically enraged by what has been said about them, right? And, curiously, the news was talking on television about what some people say and they say, oh, that's the Pope has spoken and he did not realize the magnitude that the phrases would have. Well, thank God there was a comment that said 
That's when the Pope speaks. There are people who study it in depth, and it is very clear to everyone that everything he is going to say is studied with its repercussions. And it's obvious, it's obvious. So why is this being released now, when there is so much controversy between the Muslim world and the Christian world? That's, you remember the famous letter, right? Which will lead to a third world war. That has to be encouraged. That's fire. What's better way than to add fuel at the right time, do you realize? Do you realize those phrases? They are not random. And even more so, when we know who directs all the movements of each other. A participant says, and how is this understood regarding the ecumenism they want to achieve? Why do they do it if this does not coincide with ecumenism? No, it does not favor ecumenism with whom? With the Islamic world. But it does favor ecumenism with whom? With those who are going to be victims of Islamic terrorism. As it is said, of course, the Christian world is going to come together to unite. And the Christian world needs a leader, right? A leader, an absolute leader of morality and everything you want, who represents the values of that Christianity above all and who everyone recognizes. Well, we'll talk about that a little later, okay? Um, have you found the texts? Let's see if we have a little look. We have a small problem. What we wanted to read to you are some words that also appear in a biblical text. They are cited by Jesus, and he at the same time cites them from a character of the Old Testament, a prophet, who lived about 600 years before him, more or less, called Isaiah. And he says some things that truly could be perfectly transferred to the same situation of people now. If we are lucky, we will read it. <laughs> These things happen to us because of working until late at night. <laughs> yes, theoretically, it would have to be the almost the last of everything. Well, there's been one thing that we have skipped. Had you noticed that the day the Pope made these statements, September the 14th of 2006, September the 14th, 2006, what does that add up? Shall we add up? 1 and 4, 5. Plus 9, how much? 14. Plus 2? And 6? 22. When did Sarkozy present that law? A sign, that's the 22. Power, strength. Remember, the impact was assured. The victory will be won. You understand? This is the language of their mysticism. Now we know when they speak what their symbols are. Now you will be able to understand the news that come out from a completely different point of view than the one you saw until now, because now you have arguments to understand things. And you'll realize that everything that is happening does not happen for no reason, but that someone is directing it so that it happens on one side and on the other. Let's see if we are lucky and it works out. There will be no luck. Well, I'll more or less tell you. The text came to say that having eyes they do not see, nor ears do they hear. Before, when Isaiah wrote this, he spoke giving a clear testimony of things that were evident and that people who saw and had ears did not want to accept, although it was evident. Jesus said exactly the same thing to those of his day. And now exactly the same thing can be repeated, because in the face of things as clear and irrefutable as what we are presenting, and yet, no, this is nonsense, who having eyes will not see, and having ears will not hear. 
I would rather be in the next verse, which was verse 6, which said precisely the opposite. Hopefully we have eyes and ears to understand. You see? Well, we'll go directly to the presentation, if it comes out. We had filmed, well, here you go. See, the summary of the 14th of September 2006, another strange coincidence, right? Well, now let's watch a piece of a video. And you'll say, oh, great, cinema. <laughs> well, it's news. And it is the same news that was in newspapers, but filmed on television. Because the comments, it's, it's in Catalan, okay? You all understand Catalan, yeah? Is there anyone who doesn't understand it? Well, we will try, if not, to translate it a little bit, okay? There are a few who don't. You'll have to be quick or else you're going to lose it. Well, <laughs> no, we'll try to translate a little bit. We're not going to be cruel, okay? Let's see if it comes out. We won't be able to stop the film, so I'll do a summary later. Try to capture everything you can, okay? If the video appears out, of course. <laughs> if not, we're going to look bad. Moments of uncertainty. Any jokes? <laughs> you know, today, if you've watched the program, we still had one issue left. That it was, what is the 666? But sincerely, after seeing the process of the talks, I think we still need uh, some things to be understood well. And since it will also be quite long, because it will be based on a lot of prophecies, more and more, and this is what I wanted to tell you before, I hadn't remembered. If, if all this had not been presented, and they are quite irrefutable things, I would say, what will they say when I present you prophecies described with a barbaric amount of time in advance, and that have been fulfilled to the letter, and that are completely provable with history in hand? There won't be any arguments, okay? I assure you. Not one argument can debate that. And that will serve as a basis for us to talk about the prophecies that are also being fulfilled in our days and the few that remain to be fulfilled. I say, of the few that remain to be fulfilled. On the topic of 666, you're going to discover things that will truly surprise you a lot. But we are going to make a change. We will move that talk to further on and the next day we are going to discuss if you have the brochure the topic that says in woe we'll see what that means and what is this strange card game that describes so much more than any normal card game which really is impressive that will be the topic for the next day if this has surprised you then the next one well this is recorded today, okay? They fear for the safety of the pontiff and the Vatican, right? Due to the statements. Well, these are all the headlines.
Okay. So, have those of you who don't understand Catalan understood anything? Yes? Well, those who are aware, right? In short, it is saying that the Pope's statements have sparked enormous controversy everywhere. Especially Turkey stands out a little because that is where the Pope has to go. They asked the Vatican to retract it and they have said, well, we didn't mean exactly this, misinterpretations, okay. For now, the damage is done. The first concept is always the one that remains. Remember, that's the one who hits first is the one who hits twice, they say, right? And then, of course, everyone complains, they ask for this, they say this other, trying to loosen up a little, soften the system. Even, as I told you at the beginning, there is now fear for the Pope's life. You know, there is something interesting in relation to this, because I could present another topic another day, really impressive, because it turns out that the Pope now says that his life is at stake. It may be only his life, or it may also be his headquarters, okay? We could talk a lot about that, and we could talk uh, pigeonholing it into a topic that seems to have nothing to do with it at first, and that when you start pulling the thread, it takes us back to the area of the Holy Land, Jerusalem. This is a topic that we could talk about at another time. We will touch something about it in the last of the conferences, and now you would understand a lot why everything is happening at a general level. They are working with a purpose for a Messiah to come, right? It seems that there has to be a great hecatomb first, so that everyone can access the new world order. But be careful, because the project for the Messiah to come requires something to happen in a certain area, and that certain area is Jerusalem. This is another thing. It's totally related, but it would take us much longer. Does anyone remember anything else that's been said that can be translated? Yes, what I told you before, right? It's not that they have escaped in the argument, oh, look, he said this and they haven't measured the words, but that serious analysts say that, of course, everything is measured when it is spoken. Of course. Then, besides, it's not a room like here, which is us, and this doesn't just come out of here unless it's recorded and taken to someone, but it's known that world channels are following the footsteps of the Pope. And therefore, it would be illusory not to think that this is not going to have a worldwide significance, right? And it happens precisely now in these delicate moments. Well, Well, we could talk about what is going to happen with the Vatican. We could talk about that, right? But... In other words, they criticize Mohammed for promoting Islam with the sword, but what have they been doing for so many years? Do you know... We are going to deal about a prophecy that speaks precisely about this institution and that's put some impressive elements throughout history so that you can see what strange precise coincidences. Well, we'll leave it here. By the way, have you seen the top of the obelisk? No? That's we are talking so much about. They put a little cross on top of it but the obelisk is still there.